So, 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 uh, I see we have a, a new member in, Ryan Schroer. So if you don't mind, we'll be speaking French for a few minutes again. And then I'll let uh, Justin uh, speak in English. So, uh, okay. Donc, il euh, n'y a pas d'autre chose à dire de mon côté. Euh, vous savez, il n'y a pas d'autres questions. On peut passer à Justin, ça ne me dérange pas. Parfait. Mon Justin, I leave the floor to you, my friend. Is like, oh, sorry, it's muted. Um, okay, so I'm going to just show my screen here if that's yeah. okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, it should work now. Okay. Uh, sure. Just get the slideshow going. It's okay. We see it. You want to put it? Well, yeah. Is that good? Screen, that, yeah, full screen. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, great. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about the Union Association, which was a short-lived major league that existed in 1884 and then folded uh, shortly after. It's generally considered kind of the weakest of any league that's considered to be a major league. Um, and I've also written a book on the subject that is available for creator, but we'll talk about that later. And I want to just share with you uh, some of the Canadian involvement uh, in the league because it's a you know, Canadian chapter. I'm a proud Canadian, so happy to talk about this kind of stuff. Unfortunately, there's not much of a Quebec connection, uh, but I hope you will forgive me for that. So. Um, We'll discuss. So, such a league formed in fall of 1883. Um, it was designed to be an 18 league. Uh, and the main goal was that they were going to kind of put teams in major league cities and they were going to ignore the reserve rule, which essentially bonded players to their teams that they had signed contracts with. So, teams could basically hold them in perpetuity um, as long as they wanted. Uh, and so players had a lot less freedom. And so the, the plan was we'll sign players even if they under had been reserved by other teams, which was considered a big threat to the American Association, the National League, which were the two established major leagues at that time. Um, as a result of the formation of the Union Association, to start 1884, there were 28 teams across three major leagues, along with numerous minor league teams. So basically it was the most teams and players that had ever played baseball before. But given this, the way players were recruited and given that there was still a pretty firm color line, although uh, Moses and well, they Walker ended up playing for Toledo that year, uh, there really wasn't a large pool of players to draw from. Uh, it was still, the game was very much Maybe not if it's infancy out in the west of uh, the United States and also in Canada, but they're just the majority of players were coming from the northeast of the United States, from places like Philadelphia and Boston and New York. Um, and what happened as a result of all of these teams being formed and this new league and um, this, it just resulted in sort of an arms race for players. So, so basically, anyone who could you know, throw a ball, you know, pick up a bat, was kind of considered to also be uh, signed by a team to play during the 1884 season. So yeah, there was just an increased demand for player, there's increased pressure to find diamonds in the rough. And then um, as a result, you know, Canada became kind of one of the places that uh, teams started to look for, for players. Um, and then the other sort of key figure in the Union Association that's kind of been forgotten, because um, typically if you know anything about the Union Association, it's typically about the St. Louis Club, which was owned by a millionaire, 26-year-old uh, uh, son of a uh, you know, railroad uh, who um, basically inherited millions of dollars and then started this league. Uh, his name was Henry Lucas, and he gets the majority of the attention. But there was actually another key financier in the league, and it's a guy named Albert H. Henderson, who was born in Canada. And he owned two of the clubs in the league because Baltimore and Chicago both had franchises. He owned both of those clubs. So yeah, here's a little bit about him. Um, yeah, he was born in 1847, but his family moved to the United States the same year, and he grew up in Baltimore. Uh, so he was a key figure in early Baltimore baseball and acted as a business manager for several 
top clubs, um, including the Baltimore Canaries of the National Association, which is, I consider it a major league, but a lot of people, like, depending on what source you look at, it's not considered one. It's not it's officially recognized in the records book as a major league, but I think it, it was the first professional league and has a lot of uh, importance in you know, baseball history. Um, and yeah, he basically worked as a, as a mail clerk and then he became a mattress manufacturer. It's not entirely clear how he got his money, but in 1883, he raised $10,000 and moved to Chicago and started a club called the Chicago Unions, which was a semi pro club. Um, and his plan was to join the union, uh, to join the American Association. Uh, but he was quickly rejected. Uh, and he's, he joined up with this newly formed a union association. Um, and yeah, and that was sort of the next step here. And so he held controlling interests in the Baltimore and Chicago union franchises. Um, it's actually, this is like an early version of syndicate ownership where one owner owns two clubs and splits sort of the costs between the two clubs, but also what he did was he signed players, um, like a pool of players and then split them between the clubs. And so players would move around and back and forth between the two clubs. Uh, and it was sort of designed to like, try and make the strongest one possible. And if, if one was struggling, then the, the, the move players over to the other club to help them. Um, yeah, and he was a key financier uh, in the association along with Henry Lucas. And he helped to fund a lot of the other clubs uh, and keep them afloat uh, during the season. Because the one thing that the union association, the kind of hallmark of it as a league, and if you read about its history, is it was very tumultuous. And so essentially it started with eight teams. Uh, and at the end of May, the Altoona Pennsylvania club, they folded, they were replaced by a team in Kansas City. And then in August, the Philadelphia club folded, they were replaced by a team in Wilmington. And then the Wilmington club folded and they were replaced by a team in, um, in uh, St. Paul and, you know, and then um, there was also a Milwaukee club that joined uh, and eventually um, Baltimore franchise owned by Henderson was one of the strongest clubs in the league and they drew quite well. Um, they did a, they sort of went head head with the Baltimore Orioles of the American Association and they sort of held their own. But in Chicago, it was a disaster. They they didn't draw well. They were losing money. They reportedly lost about ten thousand dollars in about four months. Um, and Henderson made a deal to move the team to Pittsburgh in August, but that stint only lasted a month. And he eventually merged the Pittsburgh franchise with the Baltimore franchise and um, so he was left with one franchise by the end of the season. So essentially, the, the league started with eight eight teams in eight cities, it ended up having 12 teams that played in 13 cities. And so it's very tumultuous. Um, and yeah, so it, it essentially is kind of like, that's one of the main criticisms of the league is that the quality was quite poor, it was very unstable. And so there's a lot of um, naysayers who sort of don't think the youth association should have been credited as a major league. Um, but it has been for, you know, over a century, so we just kind of go with it. Um, yeah, so Baltimore finished the season with a 58 and 47 record, uh, which was good for third place in the league. And then um, by contrast to the St. Louis club, they went 94 and 19, and they basically dominated the league. And there was really no pennant race. There was essentially, they they just ran over everyone. They started the season 20 and 0, and then uh, just kind of went from there. So there was really, it killed a lot of fan interest in certain markets where there just is no reason to watch your terrible team get their head kicked in by, you know, St. Louis or some of the other clubs. Um, and the Chicago and Pittsburgh franchise, they went 41 and 50. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, they they, they folded and then um, merged with Baltimore and then they were replaced by uh, Milwaukee. Um, yeah, Henderson would play about $10,000 on the season, but most of the losses were chalked up to the struggles of the Chicago club. And afterwards, he seems to have off baseball. There's some letters that he wrote basically saying he was no longer interested in being involved with uh, baseball, it's just too costly. Um, and the next year he helped to launch America's first electric streetcar line in Baltimore. And then he later studied medicine and got his doctor's license and he is credited with these inventions. And he just had this sort of strange and unusual life where he did a whole lot of stuff, but people have kind of forgotten him. Uh, and yeah, he died in 1928 at age 81. Uh, and his baseball exploits were almost entirely forgotten. And if you read anything about the Union Association, um, most sources don't really mention him or anything like that, but he's just an interesting guy I, I came across and it, it, it doubly piqued my interest that he uh, was also Canadian. So with that, we can then talk about sort of the Canadian players that were in the league. Um, there was uh, 
to my knowledge, uh, there's still a few players who we don't have identifications for and things like that. Um, and there's even been new players discovered who appeared in the league because that's the record keeping of 1884 is not uh, what it is now. Um, but essentially, yeah, there, we have nine documented Canadian boy players who appeared in the Union Association in 1884. So by province, there were six from Ontario, two from New Brunswick, and one from Nova Scotia. And 1884, across all major leagues, there's 20 Canadians who made their major league debuts that year. And that more than doubled the number of Canadians who had appeared in the majors at that point, which is reflective of the fact that uh, with 28 major league teams, you just need players. And so there's more and more players that got to have an opportunity to appear in the majors. Um, the increased demand for player was due to the increase in teams, and that meant desperate managers searched high and low for talent. Um, a number of the players who are listed as Canadian actually had relocated to the Boston area uh, when they were young, and so they were essentially were, you know, considered to be, you know, sort of Boston locals and things like that. Um, but nonetheless, they had Canadian, Canadian roots. And on July 7th, 1884, the Boston Unions, um, they became the first team to have three Canadians in the starting lineup. Uh, catcher Jim McKeever, third baseman John Irwin, and left fielder Pat Scanlon. And this is kind of like a neat little like factoid. Um, I think David Matchett, who's a member of the Toronto chapter, was kind of the first person to uncover this information. And it's just a neat little thing um, to you know have some pride in the you know, the Canadian involvement in uh, in professional baseball. And so, yeah, I'll just run through sort of um, the nine players and sort of like some of the accomplishments and things like that. Um, so probably the best of the players who appeared who happened to have Canadian ancestry was John Owen. He was born in 1861 in Toronto. Um, him and his family, they moved to Boston as a young child. He was the younger brother of Boston Red Sox and so Owen. And Oat Owen is a very fascinating character in his own right. He's credited with inventing the fielder's glove. Um, and he also famously had kind of a, a double life where he was married to two families and lived in two different cities. And then eventually he uh, committed suicide by jumping off a boat. And it's a, just one of those fascinating kind of oddball stories, but he's you know, a, an interesting figure in 19th century baseball. Um, and his, his brother, John, he was a study third baseman for Boston. He had 105, he, and he played 105 games. There was the, the league played 112 games as the like, standard schedule. Um, so he was very durable, um, and, and in 1884, third base was generally considered the most defensively challenging position because you weren't using fielding gloves, and there's a lot, the bunting had just started to become a thing, but also, um, you know, hard hit line drives, you know, when you're not wearing a fielding glove is, uh, is pretty challenging, and, and supposedly the ball that was used by the Union Association was much harder than a standard baseball, and so it resulted in frequent injuries for players who tried to field the ball. Um, he hit a very modest 234 um, by an average, uh, no power to speak of, but uh, by the league standards, I believe he had a 94 OPS plus because again, like the hitting in the league was quite poor. And uh, so, you know, if you could hit 234 in that league, it was, you know, so decent. Um, he played in the majors uh, from 1882 to 1891, and he has the unique kind of a record of appearing in four different major leagues. I think there's only about 15 or 20 players who can claim that. And so, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting guy. He returned to Boston after his career and he, uh, I guess, got a pool hall and things like that. And he died in 1934 at Boston. So he's probably the most successful of the Canadians that appeared in the Union Association. Um, just a, you know, a steady infielder, considered smart and intelligent. Um, and yeah, so next up. Uh, we have Jerry Moore, uh, forgive the sort of grainy photo, that's kind of the best one that I could find online. Um, so he was born in 1855 in Windsor, Ontario, um, home of the, the upcoming uh, uh, conference. Um, he appeared for the Altoona, Altoona Unions, which was the sort of famously kind of the worst, club, one of the worst clubs in the league. They started the season 0-11. They ended up going 6-17 and 17 and they folded. Um, they were just completely outclassed by almost everyone in the league. Um, he was a good hitter for a catcher. He had 313. Uh, he had one home run. Um, in, it was the first home run in Altoona <laughs> Union's history. Uh, and he played in 20 games, but he was really awful as a catcher. And again, the caveat being that catchers in those days uh, typically didn't use anything other than thin kind of leather gloves to sort of help ease the pain of catching fastballs. But 
uh, he was not very good by any standard. Um, he made 18 errors and had 27 pass balls in 12 games. And that's one of the reasons the unions, the Altoona club was was so poor was, was this terrible def defense behind them. Uh, they had a couple of decent pitchers, but the, the catchers couldn't hold on to the ball and just created all sorts of other runs and blowouts and things like that. Uh, when they folded at the end of May, he played in the Northwestern League, which was the best minor league in the country. Um, uh, throughout the summer, then he signed with Cleveland uh, for the National League in August. Um, and he made a couple more appearances for the Detroit Wolverines in the National League in 1885. Um, he played in the minors until 1988, uh, 1888, but he died quite young, just uh, a couple years later in 1890 um, in Wayne, Michigan. Uh, I've tried to find an obit and some more details about why he was, you know, what, what caused him to pass away at age 35, but I've not been successful as of yet. But uh, hopefully I'll find some more details about him because it seems like he was a talented player who uh, just, you know, just died a bit too young. So next up, there's Jim McKeever, who uh, he, he was from St. John, New Brunswick. He was born in 1861. Uh, he was signed by Boston as a starting catcher. Um, again, hit incredibly poorly in 16 games, just 136. Uh, he was released in July, but he played in the minors. Um, through 1888. Uh, so again, if the way it kind of worked is in, in the 1880s, like a catcher was kind of the most important position on the ball field just because um, pitchers threw very hard through the, the amount of the pitching box was only about 45 or 50 feet away, depending on the season. And so finding a catcher who could reliably keep the ball in front of them uh, and also not get injured was incredibly valuable. So you find a lot of these catchers who appeared and had dreadful batting records, but um, if they could sort of do anything at all to, to be competent behind the plate, they would get chance after chance because it was a very difficult and demanding position, um, physically taxing, uh, lots of broken hands and broken faces. Um, and yeah, so the fact that someone was willing to do this and, and you know, persevere, that, that sort of gave them a sort of a potential longevity. Um, and, and opportunities to continue playing. And then he died in 1897. So he was only 36 years old, but um, he died in Boston of what the obit said was brain fever. Um, I'm not sure what necessarily that would uh, be caused by, but that, that's what it says. So Next up, uh, there's Ed Smith. He was born in 1863 in Sparta, Ontario. Um, he grew up in St. Thomas, Ontario, uh, which is a fairly small community. Um, he was the change pitcher for the Boston Union, so he was essentially there to back up their starting pitcher, um, Bill Sweeney, who won 40 games that year and pitched 538 innings, uh, which is pretty astonishing, um, but they really struggled to find a secondary pitcher to support them, so Ed Smith was uh, the first person they, they looked to, um, and he was likely recommended by Bob Emsley, who was the star pitcher for the Baltimore Orioles. He won, I think, 35 games that year in the American Association. Um, he later became a longtime umpire in the National League, and he was famously the umpire in the, the Michael's Bono game in 1908, um, uh, one of the most famous games in National League history. And then, uh, so with, with Baltimore, he went three and four. Uh, he had a 348 ERA, um, but that's kind of deceiving because of just, you know, he, he walked a ton of batters and all, gave a bunch of honor runs. And so he's credited with a, a pretty astonishing negative 1.6 war in nine games. Uh, again, it might be overstating his uh, poor performance, but uh, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't up for the task, apparently. Um, and yeah, he's not known to have played in the minors. Um, and up until a couple of years ago, um, his identity was unknown um, for whatever reason. As part of my own research into kind of some of the more obscure players, um, I really fixated on, on this guy and the fact that I was able to find out, um, you know, his identity was really thrilling to me. Um, yeah, so we we found him in 2017, and then found a photo as well in like the local newspaper because he's a prominent citizen in St. Thomas, Ontario, uh, and he died in 1948. And then um, next up is Milt Whitehead. He was born in 1862 in Toronto. He ended up being the starting shortstop for the pennant winning St. Louis Unions. Uh, he hit just 211. Uh, on the season, he was quite a poor hitter, um, and he joined the Kansas City club late in the season. Um, I guess he got released by St. Louis, um, but yeah, he was he was he played close to 100 games for the St. Louis Unions. He was their starting shortstop. 
Um, so that's that's noteworthy, I think. He was quite good defensively. He had a 0 0.7 Warlord on defense. I know Warlord is kind of problematic to use for 1884, but um, it seems to speak to the reputation he had. He was noted for his great arm, and he pitched in the minors. And when he signed with St. Louis, he was reportedly signed to be a pitcher. So uh, the fact that he was at shortstop with this with this really strong arm, I think, was a big part of his uh, his value, or perceived value for the team. He had a long minor league career, um, so he was playing through 1895 and even later in some like independent leagues. Um, he played for at least 19 different teams all across the United States. Um, and I guess probably as a result of maybe too many beanings, different things like that, There's it's a pretty common problem for a lot of these guys who had these careers in baseball in the 19th century where they ended up with concussions and all sorts of erratic behavior. And so I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case uh, for him. Uh, and so he was committed to an insane asylum in 1897. He died in the California State Hospital um, in, in 1901. Uh, and so, yeah, he, yeah, again, like less than 40 years old. It's, it's sort of a telling that a few of these guys we've mentioned, you know, passed away so young. Uh, I think it's just a, a sign of, you know, <laughs> just how tough life was back in the 19th century. And then uh, next up, we have got Henry Mullen. Uh, he was born in 1862 in St. John, New Brunswick. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find a photo of him. Uh, he's one of the guys I'd like to find one, just because any and all Canadian players, I'd like to find uh, a photo or a woodcut or something uh, that tells us kind of what they look like. Um, he debuted with the Washington Club of the American Association, which was a very weak club that had been formed uh, to rival the Union Association's Washington uh, National franchise. Um, and that Washington club folded in August and they were replaced by a club in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, so they were also a bit unstable. Uh, and Mullen was an atrocious hitter. Um, the American Association was a tougher league, uh, but hitting 133 in 34 games probably isn't going to cut it. He supposedly went hitless in his first eight games. Um, and then he was picked up on a brief trial by the Boston Unions who cut him loose after two games in which he also went hitless. Um, he played all three outfield positions. Um, he played in the minors for a couple more years, but I believe his his batting average of 133 uh, is the lowest, or second lowest of any outfielder who played more than 25 games. So just gives you a sign of kind of how ill-equipped he was, and also a sign of just the kind of players that ended up getting chances. Was it was just so hard to find anyone who could play ball like at any reasonable level, and so guys like this kind of ended up appearing throughout the 1884 season. Um, and then, yeah, he died in 1937 in Beverly, Massachusetts, and he's another one of the guys who had relocated to Boston, you know, the Boston area as a young, young person and, you know, sort of was considered a Boston area kind of uh, presence. And another guy, similar story, uh, Pat Scanlon came from Halifax, Nova Scotia, he was born in 1861, he played in six games with uh, Boston uh, in July, he had come from the Southern League, um, he actually hit pretty decently. Um, he had 292 um, as a left fielder. Uh, it's not very clear why he didn't stick with Boston. Um, and then he went to the minor league club in Holyoke, uh, Massachusetts. And then he was picked up on trial by the Philadelphia Phillies in September, but he never appeared for them. And then he later became a police officer in Chicopee Falls, New York, and then passed away in 1913 in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. And then here's another, probably the most famous player who came out of can't famous Canadian in the in the Union Association. It's Ed the Only Nolan. Um, he was born in 1855 in Trenton, Ontario, and he grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. Um, he debuted with the Columbus Buckeyes in 1876, which was an independent club. And then 1877 is sort of where he made his reputation. He played for Indianapolis of the League Alliance, which was basically the best league outside of the National League, um, which had only formed in 1876. Um, so pro baseball was still kind of this infancy of like what it should look like. Um, but he had an astonishing season uh, in which he pitched 76 complete games. He went 64 and eight. He had 30 shutouts, he threw a no hitter, and he had a 0 0.50 ERA. Um, oh, sorry, put the typo there. But uh, he became known as the only Nolan basically for the rest of his life. So if you read accounts of him, he always calls him just the only Nolan. It doesn't even use his first name half the time. Um, and unfortunately, he was never able to live up to his um, this astonishing standard. Um, so in 1878, he went to Indianapolis when they joined to the National League, and he did not perform very effectively. 
um, and he was a very kind of troubled and difficult figure. Um, and so he was frequently suspended for his drinking, for gambling, for holdouts, um, for various reasons. So he got suspended by the National League and the American Association. And in 1884, he uh, joined the Wilmington Club of the Eastern League. Um, and that club dominated the Eastern dominated the Eastern League and was in first place in August, but they had lost money. And when the Union Association needed a team to join to replace the Philadelphia Club, uh, Wilmington joined the Union Association. Uh, and then probably became the worst team in the league. Uh, they went two and 16 and they folded uh, less than a month after joining. Um, Nolan was fairly effective uh, for a pretty poor club uh, in the union. He went one and four, but he had a 293 ERA and he struck out a, a very impressive 52 batters in 40 innings. Um, ATA four was kind of the first year where uh, in the National League, they permitted overhead pitching. Uh, so you could throw with your release the ball over your shoulder. Um, both the American Association and the Union Association did not permit it, but it had just become to the point where many pitchers were pushing the boundaries and it became increasingly difficult for umpires to police that. And so it's likely that uh, the only Nolan was also throwing above the shoulder most of the time. Um, and after his career, he, he sort of settled down. He returned to Patterson, um, became a police officer. By all accounts, he was a, was a fairly reliable uh, citizen. Um, despite his uh, tumultuous baseball career. He died in, on May 18th, 1913. And then our final Canadian is Steve Dunn. Um, again, forgive the grainy image, um, but he was born in eight, December 21st, 1858 in London, Ontario. Uh, he appeared for Milwaukee, Stillwater, and St. Paul in the 1884 uh, Northwestern League. And then when St. Paul joined the, the uni Union Association, uh, to replace, um, uh, sorry, to replace like the the Chicago Pittsburgh franchise after it folded, um, he essentially joined the Union Association. So he came, went from being a minor leaguer to a major leaguer, uh, and he played nine games for St. Paul at first base and in center field. And uh, St. Paul is kind of had, interesting because they played nine games in the Union Association, uh, but they all of them were road games, and so they remain, I believe, the only team in Major League history to never play a home game. And so Minnesota's first franchise uh, was, first Major League franchise is this like St. Paul club, but they didn't actually appear, get to play a home game. Uh, Minnesota didn't host a Major League home game until 1961 when the Twins uh, uh, debuted. And he had a modest 250. Uh, he played in the minors uh, through 1889 um, and they died in uh, May 5th, 1933 in London, Ontario. Um, and then there's one more guy I can talk a bit about. Uh, it's this guy, Harry Oxley. He was a catcher from Cove Head, Prince Edward Island. Um, he had signed with the Kansas City Unions in July, but he was threatened with a backlist, blacklist by his uh, club in Lynn, Massachusetts. He's another one of those guys who relocated to uh, the Massachusetts uh, area from Canada. Uh, and he decided to stay put. Um, Lynn folded soon after. And he ended up playing a couple of games for the New York uh, in the National League and also in the American Association, which was another situation where one owner owned both clubs and kind of would swap players back and forth. Um, but yeah, he, he was sort of almost became the 10th uh, Canadian to play in the Union Association. And so that sort of wraps up uh, my talk. Uh, so yeah, I have this book uh, coming out. Uh, it's available for pre-order right now from McFarland Books. Um, you can find it on any sort of bookseller website. Um, and yeah, hoping it will be out later this year or early next year. Um, I'm still waiting for final word on the release date. But yeah, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to get in touch. I'm pretty active on Twitter and uh, by email. So that sort of concludes the presentation. And if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Justin. Any questions, any questions for Justin? I have one. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Go okay. Uh, hi, Justin. Uh, uh, I would like to, uh, to know exactly what your sources were by doing your research. Uh, uh, I mean, newspapers, I guess, from cities where the union had teams. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's, um, thank goodness for newspapers.com and, and sites like that. There's, it's incredible what you can find. Um, fortunately, 
of the teams in the league have some papers online. Uh, and then there's also the Sporting Life, uh, which is a really incredible resource. Um, New York Clipper doesn't have tons of union association stuff, but there's some on there. Um, so yeah, a lot of online resources. Um, and then also just, I would reach out to people who I knew had knowledge. Um, and yeah, so just like, yeah, tracking down different papers and what you find that's interesting in the 1804 thing is that um, each city often had multiple papers and different papers had different approaches. So in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Inquirer, which is a really great newspaper, has really great baseball coverage. They, they were put owners of the Cincinnati Union Club. And then the Cincinnati Commercial, which is I think available on genealogybank.com uh, as well. Um, they, O.P. Kaler, who was involved with the Cincinnati Red Stockings, he was the sports writer for them. And he's like the most vicious critic of the Union Association. So you get these two different perspectives. And it's often neat to compare attendance figures because one will overblow the attendance figures, then he'll be like, no, there's actually 312 people in the audience. And like, like he's very specific and he's really trying to discredit it. But you find that in, in many of the, the cities that there's these all screen point of view. So you have to kind of like suss out what the reality of those things was. Okay, uh, well, the sub question, if I may, was yes. whether the union was covered as much as the other major leaguers. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing. It's like the the sporting life, uh, they covered, they gave really good coverage. They okay. provide all the pop scores and certain papers would cover it. But like in Chicago, the, no one cared. And so in the, in the newspapers, they'd, they'd list the Union Association like in this different section called minor games, like rather than like getting the coverage of the Chicago White Stockings. Okay. But depending on the paper, they would get pretty good okay. coverage. Okay. Yeah. Uh, may I? Yes. Yeah. I think, Justin, there's a connection between the St. Louis team and the uh, Union Association and the, the, Card is it the Cardinals or either the or the Browns and the American Association, because they, yeah, so St. Louis was the most successful team by um, by a landslide. Yes. And then they moved to a bit to a bigger, bigger league in 1885, didn't they? Yeah. So they moved. They eventually Henry Lucas uh, kind of sold out the rest of the league and joined the National League to replace the Cleveland club, which he had kind of been actively trying to buy or like undermine. Uh, and so he joined the National League, the Union Association kind of collapses without Lucas. Um, and then his team in the in the National League is is one of the worst teams in the league. And then by 1886, he's, he's sold out. And so he sold it. And then they moved the team to Indianapolis. And then that team lasted three seasons. And then they sort of folded, but they were put owned by the guy who bought the New York Giants and he moved some of the players over. So it's like, they don't have a connection to uh, the St. Louis Browns, but they, the, yeah, so they kind of folded in, in the official lineage ends kind of in 1889. Okay, so there's no direct connection with today's Cardinals. No, 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 they, yeah, they, he, he formed the club in part to rival the Brown Stockings, which became the Cardinals and um, eventually Kansas City and Washington also end up joining the National League after 1885. Like they played in different leagues and they were the same teams, same franchises, but they played in minor leagues in 1885 and then they ended up joining the National League, but they also didn't make it out of the decade. It was just, baseball was very tumultuous in the 1880s. Like lots of franchises just came and went. Anyway, your, your book is welcome because there's not much that's written about that league apart yeah. from Bill James's article. Yeah, yeah. And questioning yeah, why it's a major league. Yeah, yeah, and I, I talk about that in the book about sort of the, the, the why and the how it became recognized as a major league and also my sort of thoughts on it. Um, and yeah, to my knowledge, it's the first full length kind of book that's only about the Union Association. Like there's books that deal with its history a little bit, but this is kind of the first one that really goes all the way. Cool. Yeah. So, I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead yeah. just yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so um, with all this uh, tumultuous history, with I'm sure that owners were looking for good homes. Was there any talk at any point of moving teams up north, either to I don't know Toronto or Montreal? Um, no, not to my knowledge, I didn't come across anything like suggesting that. I think in 1884 there was still like um, there was a lot of Canadian like representation in the minors. I'm not sure if there was any Canadian teams that were credited as playing professionally in 1884. Um, there was quite a few semi-pro teams and things like that, but there wasn't really a serious consideration to go 
up north. I think in eighteen eighty five they end up there's a Canadian baseball league and that's sort of like the start. And the, I remember coming across this in eighteen eighty seven, um, like around the same time that like there was all this tumult in the National League. Like they almost put a team in Toronto in eighteen eighty seven, and but it didn't work out. So. So I was looking at the the list of players in the Union Association, and and maybe surprisingly, there's absolutely not no names that you could vaguely say that sounds French. Which is yeah, a bit yeah, yeah, yeah. Given that that they were recruiting in the New England area and all that, where there yeah. was like big immigration, so mm -hmm. like Oyo yeah. is is a place where many French Canadians moved to mm -hmm. uh, from from Quebec. It, it seems a bit surprising that there would be absolutely no French uh, presence in that league. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not like I'm not as familiar with like the relations of baseball in Quebec, but I know there was all that immigration to like New England area. Like, but I, yeah, I guess it just like whatever it didn't hadn't quite come to fruition yet in the 1884. So. Yeah, the first uh, first French Canadian players uh, turned up around the late 1890s. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yeah, I know by the 1890s, Montreal has like a team in like the International League and stuff like that. And like, mm -hmm. it starts to yeah, really take hold. Exactly. And uh, I think Yannick had a question. Yeah, Yannick. Yannick. Yeah, thank you. I First of all, thank you for the uh, lecture, Justin. It was oh, really yeah, interesting. Uh, second of all, for me, I was actually a new uh, new information about the leagues going all the way back to the 18th that way. And uh, mm -hmm. what would be, my question is basically, what would you say is the first clue or the first character that got you like, oh my God, I got to find out. Or I got to look it's into, like fall down the rabbit hole of the Union yeah. Association. Yeah, so it's a bit of a funny story, but I, I got really involved a few years ago with the Biographical Research Committee, and they, they're they trying to track down biographical information for all these players. I I'd got involved first with the Pictorial Committee, where they're trying to find a photo of every major league player. And so I made all these, I had these folders of all these obscure players, and 1884 Union Association is just like filled with tons of these guys who like, you know, we don't know anything about, or there's no photo. And like, so I built up these case files, and I started to understand how the league worked a bit. But there's one guy in particular, it's this guy who played for Washington Nationals. Uh, he played four games in April 1884. His name's Carol, the one of the owners' last name. And there's this anecdote I found about him where um, he's basically playing an exhibition game against Georgetown University. And he turns to the, the captain of the team, Phil Baker, who's like the catcher. And he's like, where is left field, Mr. Baker? And <laughs> like, and that, that sort of piqued my interest. I'm like, okay, this is like, Really interesting, and I wanted to call the book that, but the the publishers like maybe that's a little bit too obscure. So <laughs> that's all. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that that sort of that's where it comes from, and then like just you know get involved in it. It's a very fascinating story, and like kind of just a lot of odd odd characters and strange things happening in this this strange year. So that's that's why we're all doing it, right? So yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. my pleasure. Where are you based today, Justin? Uh, so I technically live in Ottawa, but I'm, I'm currently in Calgary uh, visiting my family, um, and it's it's been about five inches of snow every night, so it's pretty interesting. Because <laughs> really? two days ago it was 25 degrees. So. Oh my god! Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I got a question for you, Justin. Yes. Can you talk about your book a little bit? What will you, will you be talking about? Will you be describing the seasons and the players or uh, yeah. yeah, the pennant races or something like that? Yeah, so essentially what I wanted to do, um, so I, I talk a lot about the formation of the league and how it came to be and all the things that are going on in baseball that caused the league to come to fruition and like what the response of the established leagues was. Um, and then I really wanted to document kind of what the season was like not just like from the Henry Lucas, like St. Louis perspective, although I talked about that, but I wanted to sort of get a deep dive into each of the teams. And like, so I sort of tell the story chron chronologically, but each sort of month or so has like a different focus and different team that I'm talking about. And so I want to really get into like, you know, what life, what baseball was like in Altoona in, you know, May 1884 and like, you know, what happened with Wilmington and, and there's a lot of just odd stories and stuff. And so the, the idea was to create a sort of full-length thing that covered all the teams, covered the pennant races, covered how it started and why it ended, and then also sort of tail on a bit about like what happened with Lucas and what what the legacy of the Union Association really is, because it's a bit, um, 
it's it's it has this weird place in history where there's not really a league that did what it did. Yeah. Um, like where it, would try, it really tried to compete with the major leagues. It tried to sign players. Um, and there's a few that signed up, but most players didn't. And so they, they weren't going to be able to compete. Um, but there's no league that's like that, that doesn't have a major league designation. And so it's like a lot of the debate about whether it's a major league or not is around like the quality. But I, I focus more on the idea that it's the fact that the National League and the American Association both tried to actually stop it. And when they had the chance to kill it, they, they did. You know, like they thought okay. it was maybe not a threat, but they definitely thought it was a nuisance. And so, yeah. Okay. So, we talk about that a lot. So, stuff in the book. Okay. So, the league ended because of the, the other two leagues, right? Yeah, in large part. Yeah. Because they, they just they didn't it. want to deal with it anymore. You know, like, okay. like the, the big obstacle for Lucas was he wanted a team in St. Louis and the National League wouldn't let him in because of the ground stockings existing. And okay. so, he helped start his own league to get his own team in St. Louis and then okay. kind of from there. So mostly like the players league, maybe something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. it, it occupies a similar role, but like a bit different in that the players league had this really like specific like yeah. mandate of like, you know, mm -hmm. player player run, it's gonna add a few player rights. Whereas here I think the the choice to sign to fight the reserve rule is more pragmatic. Like we yeah. just need players and so mm -hmm. we can say we're against the girls overall and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but it's also the best way we can get players is we ignore it you know it's mm -hmm. not it's not so much yeah. like trying to defend players rights as much mm -hmm. good what's well, interesting um, is that they they put teams in major league cities where they were in direct com competition with others yeah wouldn't, wouldn't they have worked better if they had tried to get some cities that were not served by uh, so well by baseball the big issue is that the big issue is that so in 1882 the american association formed and that took up a bunch of markets in the in the west of and then in 1883 both the american association and the national league had teams in new york and philadelphia and so those were the two big markets and so um so by that point like there'd already been sort of like most of the key markets were filled up with teams and then um in the sort of the formation union association the american association responds by expanding by four teams and they put team in washington which is designed to rival like, the, the, the Washington National Club, which the New Association put there, but they also sort of put it in other cities where there had been threats that the New Association was going to put, so they're trying to block them out. Um, and then, so by January, they only have six teams in the league, and they need two more. They're going to negotiate with a Boston group to put a team in Boston, um, and then they put a team in Altoona, and that's like a disaster. <laughs> Whereas, like, when they... Altoona folds and then they put a team in Kansas City and Kansas City actually is terrible on the field but they do really well at the box office like they're drawing like 8,000 fans on a Sunday games which is like a really big crowd for that for that year and so Kansas City would have been like the best if they put a team in Kansas City to start the season that might have been a better way forward because Kansas City was kind of considered the best market not to have a team because they were 100,000 people um the main issue was that they were it's a 12-hour train ride from st louis which is furthest west to kansas city so kansas city was like just so far west that that was like the big issue um but yeah it was, the reason they didn't put teams in other cities is there just wasn't any major league locations left that like could support a team they were all filled up basically yeah so so justin what's um in terms of, of pure research, what, what, what's left in terms of players that we still don't know their identity and, and box scores that are still missing? Um, so I've got all the box scores. Uh, I've got about 66% of the games I have attendance figures for. Um, so you, you get a real sense of like, you know, who drew, who drew well, who drew poorly, that sort of thing. Um, for players, there's probably about, I think there's about seven or eight who we just don't have like any details on like first names and stuff and then there's a few more that we don't have like death dates for and things like that uh but yeah there's there's one guy who's really fascinating to me he played for baltimore his name his last name is scott he was an outfielder he played 13 games in like july and august the team won all 13 games and he hit a home run and then like but no one mentions who this guy is where he came from and then he like disappears like he he gets replaced by someone and they never mention anything about this guy. And so some people think he might be an alias of a, of a player who might've been blacklisted, but there's just, there's like zero on this guy. And he's, I think, yeah, he played 13 games and, and they won all 13, which is like very fascinating to me. And then he hit a home run, but we just don't know anything about this guy, so. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs>
More questions? I have, I have, sorry, I have another question if I may, sure. uh, yeah. Justin. Uh, like basically all those teams sharing the same cities, like you said, pretty much, but I had yeah. no other choice on location and yeah. uh, availability of crowds. And so basically, would they be sharing the same venues as of the stadiums or? No, because they, they were like, essentially what happened is the union association is considered like a prior. And so any anyone, like there's a thing that happens, uh, a lot of teams, what they do is they play exhibition games against each other or they play exhibition games against like major league teams that come to town and stuff like that. And the union association is strictly like forbidden from playing against teams in any other you know league. Uh, and so essentially they're kind of on their own trying to do whatever they can. So like the guy who owns the Cincinnati club, he actually like took the leasing rights like he he outbid like the home club for the ballpark, and so he took the park basically, uh, like as a means like to like kind of spite because he had, he'd been involved with the Red Stockings before he had helped found them, um, but like yeah they were they were not sharing resources really like there just was there's a lot of animosity like teams were considered kind of like like in opposition to each other. Don't like to share. <laughs> yeah. And that, that was before they actually had built up ballparks. They, they were yeah, just I agree. that's actually, a, I thought about my question after that in the 1880s, yeah. like all you need is a field and maybe some bleachers. Yeah, like so it, exactly. it was it was sort of, both, <laughs> it was sort of the start of it. Um, so Chris Bondura, who owned the Brown, St. Louis Brown Stockings, he had sort of pioneered like making the park into like an entertainment facility. Like you'd have like, you know, a bicycle track and you'd have like all these different things and like a beer gardens and things like that. And so, Henry Lucas, who owns St. Louis, he did the same thing with his park. Like he he put fifteen thousand dollars into making it an actual like thing, and they had like a big clubhouse and a grandstand and all that sort of stuff. And so it was sort of the start of like building up parks to be a bit more like what we envision nowadays. You know, where you have like actual dedicated stands and like you know some actual you know like food and beverage on the on the facilities and stuff like that. So would you say that the, the St. Louis ballpark was the best of the league? Uh, yeah, that and like supposedly the Cincinnati one, um, the, the okay. owner there, he put a ton of money into that and he was trying to make it like the best ballpark in the country. Like he was really planning to play in 1885. Like he was really like, mm -hmm. he, he was like, so in, in August, he signs three players from Cleveland and nationally. He signs Jack Glass Glasscock, Jim McCormick and and uh, Charles Briody. Uh, okay. And like those are two, like McCormick and Glasscock are probably the two best players in the Union Association and they probably should be in the Hall of Fame. And he signs them yeah. up, even though the team has no chance at winning the pennant. He signs them because he's planning for 1885 to be this big year for okay. his club. Okay, great. No more questions. I'm good. Good. Yeah. Well, so you hear me? So okay, so uh, thank you, Justin. It was very no, interesting. Okay. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we didn't know that that many Canadians played in the league, you know. And yeah. yeah football, yeah. we 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 knew that the league existed, no, but the history of the league, you know, not whatsoever. No, it's yeah, not yeah, a really yeah, popular yeah. league, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not like it's not well understood, and like what is understood is like these couple little things, like the Bill James article, or like yeah. you know, if you mm -hmm. see Fred Dunlap's batting line, it like it really pops when you're a kid looking through the encyclopedia, you yeah. know. And so you bring me to another question, if you don't mind. Yes. Uh, you talk about Bill James and his arguments about about yeah. the caliber of the league. No, what's yeah. your thought on it? What's the yeah. caliber? Uh, I, I think according to you, you know, like it's undoubtedly probably the weakest of any major league. Like there's not really okay. uh, any any doubt about that. There's a lot of like major Ever, players. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, like I don't think that it's like any like there's no claim that this is like a great major league or anything like that. Yeah. But um, it's yeah, so I think I agree with them in the sense that like poor quality, but like that's not really the basis for why it's considered a major league. And mm -hmm. so that's sort of the debate. And other leagues did the same, like had similar struggles. Like the National League in the early 18 in the 1870s was very tumultuous. Like like in the opening season, like the New York and Philadelphia teams, they just they they refuse to play a Western road trip and they get okay. kicked out of the league. And so they don't even finish the season with a full full slate of teams. And so and and you know like that that idea that like you know the instability of the league is like a, it's like 
that was a feature of a lot of leagues at the time, you know, like the American yeah. Association also had tumultuous, like it was just a common thing in the 1870s, 1880s, because yeah. people hadn't figured out how to make money in baseball yet. Like it was just so like yeah. very, okay. in its infancy, you know? And so, yeah. yeah, so I agree with the quality issues. Like it's, it's, okay. a, it's an issue, but it, it's a major league for me because of just the situation mm -hmm. more so than like, oh, you know, try to grade it, you know, that sort of thing. And I, yeah. I'm thankful too that the Negro National Leagues and, the, the, the seven leagues have been now given major league status because then you don't have to have that debate about like you know if the union association is a major league well why not the you know? yeah why not the other ones yeah so i think okay. it's good that they're there because it's just part of the history you know and if we use a grading system that we know right now would you say it would be like triple a or double a ball um yeah it's it's hard to say because the hard. quality was so all over depends the on the things probably and depends on, on the day yeah yeah the yeah players so playing, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So like St. Louis had a few like legit major league players. Like every yeah. team basically produced some major league talent, but mm -hmm. there was just too much like you know people who just like how did this guy you know what what why why this guy um, why yeah and so it's hard to it's hard to evaluate. But I mean essentially in terms of this 1884 baseball, the National League is undoubtedly the strongest league. American Association is a bit below. Northwestern League is like the minor league. So I'd say the Union Association is probably a bit above the mind, like the Northwestern League. Um, okay. Uh, okay. But yeah. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah. One one other thing is that the American Association, its first couple seasons, was also very unstable. Had yeah, a lot exactly. of people who just turn up for a couple of games and disappear. Yeah. 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 No, it's exactly the same thing. It's a it's a fledgling league, and yeah. it's it was hard to find players, and a lot of them they were just picked up off uh, you know, a playground, uh, asked to play a couple of games, and then let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, there's a there's a fun one in there's a game in August in Boston where the Boston catcher, he's kind of a bit of a Lagrubwa kind of figure where he's like this fun loving nice guy, but he's kind of an alcoholic and not reliable. He just doesn't show up for the game. And so they put in another player at catcher. He gets hurt like in the like the first batter. And so they have to pull a catcher from the crowd. Uh, a guy named Murphy. Again, we don't know anything about this guy. They put him in behind the plate. Within like five minutes, he's got like three pass balls and made two errors. And then they just <laughs> plop him in left field and then like you just stay there. And like, you know, it's like, all right, okay, this is how it went, you know, because you just didn't have enough guys to, to, to find the backup catcher. And then somehow Boston ends up winning the game. And this guy even drew like a walk in the in, in the days when it took seven balls for a walk. So we just was the actual ball player, or was he just a guy from the crowd? Like, who knows? And like <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, that's a bad news stories. bears, you know. <laughs> I, yeah, it's one of my favorite stories. I just I, I'd love to learn who this guy was, you know. Good. Good. Aye, that's funny. Yeah. yeah. So uh questions? More questions for Justin? No? Is that it? Est-ce qu'on peut arrêter la réunion comme ça? Avez-vous d'autres choses des commentaires en français, en anglais? Des choses, euh, Alain, est-ce que tu as eu des nouvelles de Jacques ré récemment? Oui. Euh, est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui. Oui, ouais, t'entends. Ben, c'est ça. Euh, Jacques, ben, comme vous savez, euh, il a annoncé sa retraite. Puis, écoute, ouais. euh, je souhaite de prendre soin de sa santé. C'est surtout ça là, que je pense qui est important pour lui. Oui, c'est ça. Je sais qu'au début du printemps, il avait annoncé qu'il faisait de l'anémie, c'est ça? Là? Ben, je pense une condition qu'il qu a depuis longtemps, là. Ouais. Donc, euh, je pense que c'est ça. De prendre soin de lui un petit peu, là, je pense que ça va être sa priorité. Là. Oui, exactment ça. Il n'est pas, pas jeune, jeune. Il n'est pas vieux non plus. On remarque aujourd'hui, la stage là c'est pas, pas comme ouais. avant. Là, mais quand ouais. même, là, fait que... euh, ça fait longtemps qu'il hein, y, y a beaucoup de milliards dans le monde. Il ouais. se pose un peu. Oui, c'est ça. Écoute, je, je peux peut-être te parler brièvement. Je sais que Félix est au courant parce que j'ai bon, euh, mon fameux projet sur les ligues mineures, des joueurs des ouais. ligues mineures des expos. Je ne sais pas si tu veux ouais, que ouais. j'en glisse un mot pendant une minute. Ouais, J'arrive dans le dernier stretch euh, présentement. Ah ouais. Donc, euh, autrement dit, écoute, ça fait une dizaine d'années que je travaille sur ce projet-là. Puis, euh, en fait, euh, ça date euh, du moment où j'ai écrit mon livre. En 2009, j'avais un paquet de choses. Là, puis, euh, Écoute, j'ai euh, une pile de documents sur chacune des villes où les Expos ont eu une filiale et sur chacun des joueurs qui a joué dans le système des Expos. Puis, euh, wow. écoute, je te dirais que présentement, j'ai probablement quelque chose comme 150 entrevues avec des joueurs des mineurs là, des premières années. On parle de, euh, des débuts des années 70. Mm -hmm. fait que tu comprends que j'ai pas mal de stocks. 
Euh, je suis en train de terminer tout ça. Là. Je suis en train de recueillir un petit peu toutes les informations qu'il y avait dans les guides médias des autres équipes à propos des joueurs qui ont joué avec les Expos. J'ai un contact qui les a tous ces guides médias. Okay. Je suis en train de recueillir ça, mais je te dirais que j'ai écrit une bio sur chacun des joueurs là, qui ont joué dans les filiales des Expos avec plusieurs contacts que j'ai établis au fil des années. Fait que, je te dirais wow. là, grosso modo, j'ai probablement quelque chose comme 150 000 documents, articles de journaux, <rire> puis euh, sur euh, l'histoire des expos présentement. Je pourrais peut-être faire, abandonner une présentation sur la façon dont les filiales des expos ont été gérées à travers les années. Oui, ouais, ça serait intéressant, ça. Écoute, euh, surtout que tu connais pas mal ça, non? C'est pas un néophyte dans le domaine, non? Ben, écoute, je suis en perdu. C'est pour ça que je te dis, ça fait 10 ans que je travaille là-dessus, que je n'ai pas encore terminé. J'ai d'autres projets. Là. Je suis en train de travailler un petit peu ouais. sur euh, le baseball universitaire. Euh, en raison des changements qui ont eu lieu dans les, le repêchage, là, de, oh. euh, le baseball universitaire qui va probablement prendre de plus en plus de place. Fait que les propriétaires, eux autres, qui, ce qu'ils aimeraient, c'est ni plus ni moins que leur filiale soit remplacée par le réseau universitaire, un peu comme ce qui se fait au basketball puis au football, même si okay. la réalité n'est pas la même. Mais tu sais, ça leur viendrait moins cher à former les joueurs. Ça, ça revient tout le temps à ça. Là. Même oh, ouais, si je pense qu'à long terme, c'est pas une très, très bonne affaire parce que là, tu t'éloignes de de petites communautés où le baseball était roi, puis là, ben, tu te de donner la place à d'autres sports. Je pense que c'est une vue qui était très court terme, ouais. euh, sans penser aux conséquences à long terme de ce genre de décision-là. Euh, puis déjà, cette année, euh, ça a rué dans les brancards, dans les petites villes. Là. Ah, ben c'est sûr. Je sais hein? que le baseball majeur, euh, bon, euh, c'est donné de peine. Euh, euh, c'est montré euh, une belle image en essayant d'avoir des euh, ligues euh, universitaire, là, si tu veux, pendant l'été, c'est-à-dire les gars qui ne sont pas repêchés ou à qui il reste encore une année ou deux au niveau universitaire. Donc, en essayant d'aider ces, ces communautés-là, mais ces communautés-là, c'est-à-dire, n'ont pas beaucoup d'argent. Ce n'est pas ça. des grosses villes, surtout quand tu parles de la Ligue des pionniers, la Ligue des Appalaches. Là, ouais. quand, euh, puis pour être déjà allé à, John, à, James, euh, voyons, à Jamestown, Jamestown ouais. le stade qui n'est pas jeune jeune, puis il euh, y avait besoin d'un IP solide. Tu sais. C'est ça. Ça fait que, tu sais, puis pour des gars qui évoluent en division 1, d'aller dans des endroits comme ça, les gars vont aller dans des places plus connues, tu sais, comme la Ligue Cape Cod euh, ou la Ligue Northland, tu sais, des, 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 des ligues universitaires qui sont déjà des ligues universitaires d'été, là, si tu veux, là, ce qu'ils appellent voilà. euh, en anglais des College of League d'été, là. Ils vont aller dans des places plus établies pour se faire voir, là, tu sais. Mm -hmm. que, en tout cas, il y a bien des choses qui se passent. De toute façon, on en parle souvent dans notre balado, là. Oh ouais. euh, c'est ça, j'ai commencé à travailler pas mal, là, sur, euh, faire des recherches là, sur euh, le baseball collégial. Euh, juste un aparté, je suis allé, au, sur, euh, à, la, je suis allé à Saber en passant, là, je suis allé au, au congrès. Oui, à Baltimore. Puis euh, je suis allé voir là, le, le, la réunion du comité collégial qui prend de plus en plus de place, mais le gars il était un petit peu découragé, puis avec raison, parce que quand tu y penses, euh, le comité ben, collégial ou universitaire là, sont traduits correctement. Ouais. regroupe tous les autres comités en un. Pensez comme il faut, là, mais c'est à ah, peu ouais. près ça qui se passe. Là. Ça. Ah, ouais. Lui, il est pris avec, je te dirais, avec tout ça en même temps. Comment intégrer tout ça et l'élargir aux autres comités? C'est à peu près son défi. Là. Euh, ce ce gars-là travaille tout seul. Il a fait mm -hmm. un job colossal en, en faisant un répertoire de tous les coachs. Okay. Mais là, euh, je te dirais, l'affaire, c'est que là, il a intérêt à ajouter des assistants coachs. Parce que tu te retrouves avec des cas, par exemple, comme Tim Hudson, comme Mike Pelfrey, qui sont des nou nouveaux retraités, mais qui sont assistants entraîneurs, okay. <rire> tu sais, qui n'ont pas intérêt à être des gérants. Puis ces mm -hmm. gars-là, ils euh, ne travaillent pas gratos. Tu sais, euh, C'est des, très... des, des gros jobs. Là. Ils sont mieux mm -hmm. payés que pitching coach dans le baseball majeur. Mm -hmm. tu sais? Ouais. Ça fait que euh, là, il va falloir que ben, ben, mais ce gars-là ne peut pas tout faire tout seul. Là, ça fait que, ouais, non, imagine que non. Là, que je... je travaille un petit peu dans ce comité-là à temps perdu parce que j'ai d'autres choses et j'ai d'autres ouais. euh, priorités, dont une, c'est dans l'entre-saison, moi, c'est d'apprendre l'espagnol parce que au nombre, ben, au nombre de sources espagnoles qui se multiplient sur le web, là, je pense que c'est pas un luxe de, de, de commencer à s'informer sur ce qui se passe là, en République ouais. dominicaine, Porto Rico, Venezuela, etc. Ouais. Ouais. Fait, que, euh, fait que voilà. C'est ah, un peu bon. euh, mise à jour de, mon, euh, de, de ma recherche. Peut-être qu'à un moment donné, là, je pourrais en parler de, euh, plus amplement. C'est bon, ça. Mais, moi, je vais, je vais faire une mise à jour, ça ne vous dérange pas. J'avais commencé l'année passée à, à rédiger l'histoire du stade de Lormier. 
Ça avance encore. Par contre, là, j'étais en recherche en point un bon bout de temps. Il a fallu que j'arrête. Puis euh, pour ceux qui ne le savent pas encore, imaginez, j'ai par un, une chance euh, incommensurable. Je travaille présentement dans l'édifice de la Grover, qui était en face du stade de Lormier, là où ça tenait. Fait que euh, j'ai recommencé. Donc, ça veut dire que ni plus ni moins que je rédige l'histoire du stade de Lormier, du stade de Lormier. <rire> Mais ça va bien, mais comme je vous dis, j'ai un nouvel emploi, donc ça me retarde un petit peu, mais ça avance. Là, euh, vous allez voir ça. Que quand ça va être fini, ça va être comme toi, Alain. Là, ça, des nouvelles informations que personne d'autre connaît. C'est euh, des choses assez intéressantes que j'ai découvertes. Euh, d'autres choses, d'autres commentaires? Euh, moi, moi, si je peux me permettre, j'ai euh, cette année, cette année j'ai un peu moins de temps par rapport à d'un, je rien publié encore, mais je commence dans. Dans, dans, dans le métier, si on peut dire. Puis, euh, j'ai trouvé un peu des informations à savoir de, de la Ville de Québec sur l'histoire du baseball à Québec. Puis, Christian m'avait aidé un peu, m'avait dirigé, m'avait pointé vers euh, quelques matchs hors concours qu'il y avait eu entre les Royaux et euh, d'autres équipes de, de, de la Ligue euh, jadis qui avait été à Québec euh, dans les années 56, 57 et 58. Donc, j'ai toute l'information présentement, même la documentation que j'ai regroupée. Il me resterait peut-être seulement comme à faire une, à préparer une présentation. Puis, euh, c'est quelque chose que j'aimerais travailler pour euh, présenter anyway, en 2023. Puis, une autre information aussi, un petit projet que j'ai, que je suis en train de préparer. Il y avait eu un match en 1908 aussi sur les plaines de l'Abraham à l'occasion du 300e de Québec. Puis euh, j'ai tout trouvé l'information de ça. Ça a été une équipe de Montréal contre euh, la Rock City Tobacco. Euh, dans le fond, l'usine de cigarettes qui est présentement juste à, à, à l'autre côté de, 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 de l'autoroute au stade de Québec. Là. Donc, euh, c'était l'équipe locale... Euh, de l'usine dans le fond, puis le roi et tout ça, tout le monde était là pour le match. Donc, OK. Wow. Ben même ouais. la ah, ouais. bonne information. En 2023, Yannick, euh, ça serait une bonne présentation, ça. On aimerait euh, ça de t'entendre, ça. Euh, super, je vais travailler là-dessus. <rire> On se tient au courant. Euh, bon, je peux peut-être dire de mon côté. Euh, oui, vas-y, Philippe. Oui, je continue à travailler beaucoup sur le site de Baseball Reference Saber. Euh, entre autres, quand il y a eu la décision de reconnaître les ligues des Noirs comme des ligues euh, majeures, ça a créé euh, beaucoup, beaucoup de pages de joueurs à créer. Mais là, on peut dire que le site est à jour. Il y a une page pour chaque joueur, une page pour chaque équipe par, par saison. Et je travaille en ce moment beaucoup sur le, les, les éliminatoires. J'écoute les matchs d'Alain. Ensuite, je fais les résumés le matin suivant. Euh, on a des, des résumés complets de chacun des parties des euh, éliminatoires. J'écoute aussi Roger et Denis Casavant. Euh, il faut bien, faut bien savoir ce qui se passe dans l'autre ligue aussi. C'est euh, surtout ça que je fais. Et J'ai tombé, j'ai eu à écrire beaucoup d'articles sur des joueurs japonais. J'essaie d'enlever ce qu'on appelle les liens rouges que vous connaissez sur vous allez sur les Wikipédia, les joueurs qui n'ont pas d'articles. Il y a beaucoup de joueurs japonais fascinants qui ont, qui ont fait des choses euh, remarquables. Et maintenant mm -hmm. que Google Translate nous permet de transformer une page en caractère japonais en français un peu bizarre, ça ouais. permet d'écrire des articles sur des gens dont on ne soupçonnait pas l'existence, qui sont oh. extrêmement intéressants. Et de découvrir aussi à quel point les fans japonais sont passionnés, parce que les articles de Wikipédia japonaise sur les joueurs sont parfois hilarants. Hein? Il y a, de, de, ah, y a ouais. des détails bizarres qui restent. Okay. Se... <rire> J'ai hâte que tu t'attaques aux joueurs taïwanais et sud-coréens. Oui, ça, je laisse ça à Micha, à Micha Gelman. Ça, c'est son, son exemple. Son, <rire> euh... son dada. Son dada, oui, tous ces tournois internationaux et des équipes bizarres comme Fidji, et, euh, etc. <rire> Les, euh, les frères et les femmes, là. Oui, c'est ça, les Brother Elephants, <rire> le China Trust Wales. Non, je mets, les Japonais, c'est quand même... Les, vu que les liens, maintenant, sont très forts avec le baseball majeur, c'est quand même... Ouais. Euh, ouais. Ouais. Juste euh, souligner, peut-être, ça n'a rien à voir avec moi, là, mais euh, il y a le livre sur Claude Hermont qui va sortir hein, très bientôt, là, écrit par Marc Robitaille, là, je pense qu'on ouais. appelle d'être souligné. Oui, au mois de novembre, exactement ça. Ouais. Euh, on va Marc à bientôt, peut-être euh, la première réunion du mois de janvier, là, on est nous parler de ça. Ce sera le, le troisième livre, mais la, vraie, la première vraie autobiographie en profondeur de Claude. J'en ai manqué ça. une, c'est lesquelles les deux autres, le troisième livre? Il y avait celui que, il y avait ça, son autobiographie, puis il y en avait une qui avait été faite à la, la dernière année des Expos. C'est un livre assez mince sur une biographie de Claude Raymond, ça s'appelle « Ma recherche okay. sur Claude Raymond ». C'est qui okay. qui avait écrit ça? Oh, c'est quelqu'un qui n'est pas nécessairement un historien de baseball. 
Mais il, était, il y avait une fois une table au stade olympique que j'étais allé voir un match, puis Claude était là, il signait des copies, alors ah, ouais. j'ai acheté une copie. Ouais. C'est combien de pages? Euh, c'est 100, 120, c'est pas très... Okay. C'est... OK. C'est plus pour les enfants, je pense. Ou les... Oui, les c'est enfants, ça, c'est plus pour les, okay. juifs, c'est pour les juniors. OK. okay. Euh, j'ai une question. Puis, euh, est-ce que quelqu'un a lu le livre euh, qui a été écrit, ça fait une quinzaine d'années de ça, euh, un Toronto contre Montréal? Oui, je l'ai. Euh. Est-ce que tu Carey? Euh, Jonah Carey? Non, non, c'est pas Jonah Carey. Non, non. Il avait non. fait une présentation à l'époque où euh, c'était oh, pas oui, qui était euh, euh, Chuck, David Luchak. C'est ça, exact. C'est... Est-ce que c'est... ça vaut la peine? C'est, c'est intéressant, ça couvre les deux dernières années des expos, en, par, en particulier, assez, assez en profondeur. OK, OK. Euh, j'ai, j'ai une copie, si tu veux. Euh... Ouais, écoute, je vais voir sur le web, là, euh, je vais voir euh, bon, sur le web qu'est-ce qu'il y a de disponible. Parce que, parce que je ne crois pas que ça a vendu des tonnes. Non, je ne ouais, pense pas. Je n'ai jamais vu ça sur les, euh, sur les tablettes, pas que, ben, franchement. Non. Là. non, je l'avais commandé direct. Je crois que c'est, euh, je sais pas si c'est McFarland qui ne l'avait pas... Qui l'avait. Ouais, je pense si que c'est oui. le cas, tu peux toujours oh, le trouver. Je ne suis pas, sûr. Je, suis sur pas sûr, parce que je me souviens pas de l'avoir vu sur la. Je n'ai pas manqué beaucoup de congrès là, depuis 2002, là, puis je n'ai ouais. jamais vu le, le... sur le... l'étalage. Là, ouais. de... okay. Enfin. Moi, moi, je l'avais acheté quand il y avait amené une pile là, à Réunion. Mm-hmm. Que je l'avais acheté là. Ah oui? OK. Ouais. okay. Je me souviens de ça. C'est ça, c'était... Je me souviens bien de la Réunion, ça se passait dans le bureau de Neil Raymond à la place de Marie. OK, c'est bon. Oui. Donc, euh, ouais. Euh, Christian, tu avais quelque chose à dire? Oui, je voulais juste terminer avec euh, deux de mes projets sur lesquels je travaille. Un, j'ai, ouais. euh, il y a, peut-être l'année passée, là, j'ai fait tout le, le tour de la Ligue Laurentienne, qui je pense est un peu un angle mort dans notre, euh, dans notre histoire là, des, des années 50. Euh, super intéressant, honnêtement. Il y a du stock, euh, de, beaucoup de joueurs là, de la Ligue provinciale qui sont déplacés là au milieu des années 50. Euh, beaucoup de joueurs noirs aussi. Euh, donc, euh, Claro Duani, par exemple, qui a passé des, une année à Sainte-Thérèse, je pense. Donc, il y a vraiment du stock intéressant. Wow. Euh, un coach noir aussi, là, j'ai oublié son nom, euh, Fleming, qui est un ancien des Panthères noires là, des années 30, qui, était, qui traînait toujours au Québec, euh, qui, qui était gérant. Il y avait euh, probablement euh, le blond, lui. Oui, il était marié avec une fille de Québec, je pense, ouais, euh, à Madeleine. Ouais. Puis, il a disparu un peu de façon à J'ai été contacté par... Euh, une ville où il a été gérant là, dans, dans un niveau plus inférieur dans les années 40, qui voulait nommer une ville, une rue à son nom, mais on n'arrivait pas à trouver vraiment d'informations biographiques plus que ça, d'où il venait exactement. Euh, donc là, je ne sais pas trop, là, présentement, j'ai juste euh, accumulé la liste de joueurs le plus possible, tout ça, mais je n'ai rien de, de, de plus. Juste l'histoire de comment les, les villes où, c'est, où ça s'est déplacé, c'est intéressant. Puis aussi, j'ai, euh, je me suis engagé à écrire un, art, un chapitre pour le livre de, du, chap, du uh, Minor Leagues Committee euh, sur la période des années, fin des années 40 au euh, milieu des années 60. Et donc, encore une fois, je vais parler de la Ligue provinciale, mais sous l'angle de, justement des changements qu'il y a eu, donc qui sont passés de hors la loi à dans le réseau, mais indépendant, suivi d'affiliés directement comme des clubs filiales euh, des, des ligues majeures. Euh, puis comment le déclin a été rapide en termes d'assistance. Là, Drummondville est passé, par exemple, de plus de 100 000 spectateurs à, par année à 25 000, je pense, la dernière année. Donc, ça a été, le déclin a été ultra rapide. Euh, puis en partie, la Ligue, la ligue Laurentienne, je peux la mentionner un petit peu là-dedans parce que eux justement, ils... ils ils n'étaient pas affiliés, donc on pourrait penser, mais aussi là, les assistances étaient absolument désastreuses dans cette ligue-là. Donc, euh, c'est un peu, j'ai réussi à trouver un peu de chiffres sur les, les, les finances et puis les assistances, un peu tout ça. Donc, c'est cette partie-là le plus qui est mentionnée dans, cette, dans cet article-là. Euh, Christian, j'ai une question, parce qu'il y a des gars de la Ligue provinciale, des Québécois, là, dont euh, la biographie, je pense, euh, Philippe pourra peut-être élaborer là-dessus, là, mais il y a quelques gars, bon, on n'a pas les prénoms, puis tout ça, puis... Ça me dit que ces gars-là ont probablement joué dans un calibre plus fort au Québec. Nommément la Ligue Laurentienne, as-tu la liste des joueurs ou si c'est. J'ai, j'ai une liste de, de noms, évidemment. J'ai, j'ai pas, euh, j'essaie de relier, par exemple, aux, euh, euh, soit les, les, les identités sur Baseball Reference ou les, les cartes, euh, comment ça s'appelle, euh, du Sporting News, quand j'ai des informations. Ouais. Il euh, y a des Québécois que j'ai, j'ai des noms parce qu'ils sont mentionnés dans les journaux, mais ils ont, ils ont joué juste du, du baseball okay. local, disons. Euh, je n'ai pas tous les noms, évidemment, okay. euh, mais j'en ai plusieurs. Je pense qu'il y a, un, il y a déjà un bon déboursaillage de faits. 
À l'occasion aussi, je vais, quand il y a des joueurs, euh, disons, qui ont joué les majeurs, là, qui, sont, qui ont des, qui des trous noirs, qu'on ne sait pas, ils étaient où, qui étaient dans la Ligue Nord-Ancienne, j'essaie de le mettre sur, euh, sur Baseball Reference, euh, sur, sur la, la partie euh, bullpen, là, pour euh, au moins donner cette information-là, mais euh, ça arrive à l'occasion. Il y a okay. Pat Cantleberry que j'ai trouvé, là, qui, a, qui a joué dans les Negro Leagues, puis dans les Ligues majeures, qui a passé par, euh, par la Ligue Nord-Ancienne. J'oublie, c'est dans quelle ville, je pense que c'est saint eustache quelque chose comme ça. Donc, euh, il y a des, des choses qui, euh, okay. à l'occasion, que, que je, je, je veux partager. Euh, puis, euh, où c'est des joueurs qui ont, qui ont joué avec Major et qu'on ne savait pas il était où ces années-là. OK. okay. Écoute, j'ai une question pour Philippe. Si tu me permets, euh, Patrick? Bon, ben vas-y, vas-y, c'est le temps. Écoute, c'est par, par rapport à Baseball Reference. Puis, la question que je me pose par rapport au baseball indépendant, là, la Ligue provinciale, c'en était une Ligue indépendante en 68 et 70. Est-ce que tu penses qu'à un moment donné, ces trois années-là pourraient rentrer dans Baseball Reference? Je crois, euh, parce que les ligues indépendantes actuelles font, en font partie. Oui. Je pense qu'ils remplissent qu les critères. Oui, oui, je crois que j'ai aucun doute. C'était ouais. une ligue pleinement professionnelle euh, avec des joueurs, plusieurs joueurs qui ont joué ailleurs dans les ligues mineures. Oui, je parle de ces trois années-là spécifiquement. Là. Oui. La question, c'est est-ce qu'il y a une base de données statistiques euh, fiable, suffisante? Je ne sais pas, mais je pense qu'il passe à travers le comité des ligues mineures de Sabre pour ça. OK. Il y a quelqu'un qui m'avait fait parvenir, moi, des, euh, des trucs sur ces, ces trois années-là. Il faudrait que je fouille dans mes affaires. Ben, euh, c'est quelques... probablement moi. Ils sont sur mon site, les trois, les, ces trois années-là. C'est les trois années qui ont le, les meilleurs stats et aussi la meilleure calibre. OK, tu l'as. Oui. OK. Euh, bon. pour, pour 1970, par exemple, il m'a été donné par quelqu'un de Ted Firmines à toute. Euh, j'ai une feuille pour chaque joueur avec le, le game log euh, original. Okay. Euh, puis les autres années, j'ai euh, les stats euh, finales euh, bon, qui ont été publiées. C'est ça. C'est Pépé Frigas ce qui est passé par cette ligue-là avant de signer avec les Expos. <rire> bon, il y a, je sais pas, il y a peut-être une douzaine de joueurs là, qui, ont, qui ont passé par les ligues majeures la plupart avant. Euh, dans ces années-là. Il, ouais, il y en a deux qui sont allés après. L'autre, c'est Norman Gellini. Je pense que c'est les deux seuls là, qui ont pas. Parce que je te parle de la Ligue provinciale 68-70. Ouais, ouais. C'est ça. Parce qu'il est devenu open à partir de 68. Tu sais. Puis euh, la Ligue est morte quand la Ligue Eastern s'est installée à Québec là, puis euh, à Trois-Rivières. George Gumel, je pense que ça n'allait pas très bien les dernières années. Euh, ça commençait. Les, les petites villes avaient de la misère à suivre. Oui. George Gumelge, qui a écrit un livre sur sa carrière dans les, les, les filiales des Tigers, qui est ensuite devenu un professeur universitaire encore ouais. actif, il a, écrit, ouais. il a joué deux trois saisons à exactement à cette époque dans la Ligue provinciale. Et il en ouais. parle beaucoup de comment c'était organisé, beaucoup, ouais. comment c'était de jouer là-dedans. Ah oui? Ouais, très intéressant. Ouais. C'est dans un de ses livres, ça? C'est dans son livre « Playing with Tigers ouais. ». George Melge? Oui. Okay. Il, ben, il a écrit plus qu'un livre, je pense. Ah, il, a écrit, il a écrit une ça, vingtaine hein? de livres. C'est ça? Okay. C'est un professeur de sociologie, d'anthropologie okay. sociale. OK, je vais regarder ça. C'est un des amis de Rob Elias qui, qui avait oui. donné une, une, une des présentations qui était présent aujourd'hui, mais qui vient de quitter. Là. OK. Oui, c'est ça. Euh, il a joué là-dedans dans la Ligue, lui. Bon. J'ai été en contact avec lui et puis il m'a aussi mis en contact avec d'autres joueurs là, de Drummondville de ces okay. années-là. Donc, euh, wow. j'ai plusieurs des photos de, sur mon site qui viennent de, de cette source-là. OK. okay. Alors, je suis à peu près. Il, doit il être, jouait euh... dans les années, fin des années 60, donc okay, ça te donne... C'est ça, sur ouais. les 15 minimums. C'est ça. Ouais. Mais il est encore, il, est, il enseigne encore, parce que je, ben, ouais. comme, comme tous les profs universitaires. Là, il... Ouais. Ouais. il y a André Rousseau qui a probablement du stock sur cette, euh, cette époque-là aussi, parce okay. qu'il y a pas mal de la Ligue. OK. J'imagine que oui. Ouais. Si on le fait en personne, à un moment donné, André Rousseau ne sera peut-être pas une mauvaise personne d'avoir comme invité. Là. Exactement ça. Surtout que ben toi, tu, tu le connais très bien. Moi aussi, je t'ai mis Facebook avec lui. Fait que je, peux, je pourrais y communiquer pour, sans ouais. problème. Pour, pour on, a jour, on a le même jour de fête en plus. Ah ben c'est le fun, ça, moi aussi. <rire> on pourrait faire ça la journée de votre fête. On vous célébrait les deux ensemble. Oh, en plein milieu de l'été, je ne suis pas sûr. En tout cas. Le, le, ben, je sais. Ouais, ouais, il, il, est très dur, il est très dur à avoir en réunion, Alain. On, on, on te remercie d'être là aujourd'hui. C'est... Je veux juste te dire que la préparation est faite depuis le début de la série. Là, ça fait que... okay. ouais. ben, Parle-nous donc de ce qui va arriver avec les Yankees et Houston, d'après toi. Ben, regarde, juste le fait que Christian Rabien lance aujourd'hui. As-tu vu son, son dossier depuis qu'il est dans les zones majeures? C est, c est, il n'y a ouais. pas un lanceur plus coriace que lui depuis qu'il est là. Est la, la, la moyenne au bâton contre lui, c'est même 
Je vais regarder juste avant de m'emmener. Là, je pense que c'est 178, 179 en ouais. carrière. Pas cette année. Non, en carrière. Je veux dire, ce gars-là, je ne sais pas comment il fait. Il y a deux tirs, mais les gars ne sont pas capables de le frapper. Puis c'est pas parce que la balle arrive à 98. Là. Ce gars-là a une façon de lancer qui est unique et qui est euh, très, très coriace. Écoute, je, ouais. Marc pourra peut-être élaborer ouais. là-dessus. Moi, j'ai l'impression que les Yankees, je pourrais le garder plus de tirs. Je viens de garder le line-up. C'est Rizzo qui frappe premier aujourd'hui. Okay. C'est sûr que Cole va falloir qu'il en sorte une grosse. Mais, Houston ne ouais. fera pas beaucoup non plus. Ils sont juste plus opportunistes. Oui, c'est ça. C'est ça. Ouais. Même les Yankees, en deux parties, ils sont fait striker 30 fois. Hein. Ben, c'est. <rire> C'est hein? sûr que quand tu fais du vent là, à soigner comme ça, euh, les Philippines, lui, les Philippines s'arracheraient les cheveux là, si ça en est capable de faire ça. Là. Tu sais, tu con... hey, rentres ça sur, sur des prises là, sur euh, 2 fois 27, on s'entend, là, c'est hein? C'est énorme. Là. Philippe, là, il disait, tu peux rien fabriquer. Avec... Il ne sera pas capable de gérer dans le baseball d'aujourd'hui, comme la plupart des gérants de l'époque, de toute façon. Là, ouais. le, le baseball a changé depuis l'époque où il était ouais. gérant. Ouais. C'est ça. Est-ce est que, est que tu vas couvrir les séries mondiales, Alain? On, ça, on est sur place, on attend de savoir. On aimerait, pour la ville, on aimerait bien ça aller à New York, mais euh, Houston est allé mm -hmm. deux fois, puis donc, ça fait, tu n'as pas oublié d'aller trois Diego. fois. Je te parle juste pour... J'avais manqué le congrès oui, à San Diego. Si okay. je n'étais pas allé, ce serait les, 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 les boys. Euh, Marc, il adore San Diego pour être déjà allé. Là, lui, c'est une de ses villes préférées. Euh, moins Philadelphie. <rire> Regarde. C'est vrai que c'est ça. Donc, mais, écoute, idéalement, là, on aurait eu Metz Yankees. On serait resté ouais. à New York pendant ouais. une semaine. Là, puis on, donc, ça. Je pense que ça aurait été pas pire si on avait pas avoir cette série-là. Ou encore même Philadelphie, New York. Tu sais, ouais. On, on l'aurait ouais. fait entrer. C'est ça. Tu es, 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 es en série mondiale, là, tu ne regardes pas, là, tu prends, tu prends qu ce qu'on te donne, puis euh, tu es bien content d'être là. Avec raison. Hein? D'autres choses, les amis? Des commentaires, questions? Rien d'autre? On arrête la réunion là? C'est bon. Merci Parfait. beaucoup euh, d'avoir organisé ça. Oubliez pas. À la prochaine, tout le monde. Décembre. Le 3 décembre, n'oubliez pas la prochaine réunion. C'est bon. Fait que ça va être Christian puis moi, normalement, à moins qu'il y ait un changement de programme. Je vous aviserai avant. Là. Je vous enverrai là, la notice comme je fais d'habitude. Mais euh, normalement, ça devrait être le 3 décembre. C'est cool. On va attendre la mise à jour. Parfait, ça, Alain. Et merci à Justin pour la présentation. Thanks, ouais, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Bon. Thank, thank, you, Justin. thank you very much, Justin. Merci. <laughs> thank you. And uh, it, was a, it was a French crash course for you, uh, Justin. Oui, yes, c'est un crash, oui. Merci. And then thank bonjour. you, thank you, Justin. Okay, salut, guys. Salut, bye. Merci, bye. bonjour. Salut, Yannick.